holding this hearing. And I want to thank Mr. Liddy uh, for appearing before this committee again to help us with our work. Uh, Mr. Liddy, uh, the title of today's hearing was AIG, where is the taxpayer money going? And uh, in addition to that, in the letter of invitation that was sent to you and discussed with your counsel, uh, in part, we asked you to respond to the question, where, it, where is the federal, uh, federal financial assistance going? Where is the taxpayer money going? Uh, regrettably, in your written testimony, we gave you an ample opportunity to, to provide a written response of reasonable length uh, to that question, where is the federal money, where is the taxpayer money going? Uh, you did not respond to that in any, any significant fashion. There's not a sentence in there that addresses the central question of where, where is the taxpayer money going. And, and look, I'm, I'm trying to work with you. I understand that you, you came out of retirement to do this. I understand you're working for a dollar a year. I understand all that. But we're not getting the responses that we, we expect. I don't think there's a majority tax, um, excuse me, I don't think there's a majority shareholder in this country owning 80 percent of any company that's being treated like the American taxpayer is in this case. It's a plain fact that AIG would have gone bankrupt but for the goodness of the American people to step forward and rescue this company. That should have been a game changer on your side. That should have signaled a shift, that this company is now 80 percent or 79.9 percent owned by the taxpayer. And it's a new ball game, one of transparency and, and accountability to the American taxpayer. I have not seen that happen. I did not see that happen in the, in the bonus controversy, which, which, which continues because the, diff the numbers are different now than they were last time you were here. And this lack of information that we'll get back to you, I'll have somebody dig up those documents for you, uh, and a complete absence of any response to the central question of where the taxpayer money is in your opening statement or in the written testimony that we asked you to provide. I'm disappointed at that. I'd love to work with you. I'm not here to, you know, I'm not here to be contentious, but I'm here to do my job on behalf of the American taxpayer. And I, I associate myself strongly with the words of Mr. Kucinich earlier today. I feel like you're trying to roll us and you, you're trying to obfuscate things and, and, and obstruct us from, from doing the job that we need to do. You did mention in your, your statement the fact that uh, AIG has reduced their nominal exposure from 2.7 trillion to 1.5 trillion. So let me ask you about that. Since you haven't responded to the central question of the hearing, let me ask you about that. You reduced the nominal, excuse me, the notional exposure uh, from 2.7 trillion to 1.5 trillion. But how much of that reduction have you accomplished by shifting the exposure to the American people, either, the, either through the Fed, through Treasury, through Maiden Lane, or through any of these uh, TALF or uh, any of these other uh, federally or taxpayer-backed entities? Uh, little, if any, of that would, of that notional, of that reduction in notional exposure would have anything to do with the number of items that you just mentioned. That notional exposure has been reduced by settling those trades, uh, selling the books of business, and just overall downsizing of the business known as AIGFP. Would, let me ask you, the, uh, I know that we approved up to 50, well, I think it was Treasury approved up to uh, 52.5 billion in loans uh, in order to purchase troubled assets uh, that were formerly owned by AIG, now owned by the United States government. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that result in a shift to, to, from AIG to, to the government? Yes, that, that, that would have. And I was, I'm sorry, I was trying to draw a reference to the last time we had a conversation about this, what has changed. So Maiden Lane was put in place in November of 2008. 
and you're absolutely correct, some of those assets would have been transferred into the Federal Reserve uh, after they did a very thorough valuation analysis of what their potential would be. Since then, any reduction in the notional value has not been as a result of a transfer. Okay. There's also up to $34.5 in Fed loans retired by securities and equity interests provided to the government by AIG. Again, That's that on top of the $52.5 billion that I, I first mentioned. Those, those were all items that were as a part of Maiden Lane, either two or three, and go back to November. Since then, we haven't transferred any additional risk to the American public. So you're, you're basically saying this is right then. The 86, 87 billion here went from AIG to the U.S. government here. Well, and assets, assets with real values got transferred to the Federal Reserve. And they got transferred at, uh, I don't remember the exact number, 45 Are? or were these, uh, no, the assets got transferred to the Federal Reserve at cents on the dollar, let's say 50 cents on the dollar. Yeah. So the Federal Reserve has the opportunity and the American public has the opportunity to benefit from any appreciation or recovery in those asset values. That's what Maiden Lane and 2 and 3 are, are all about. Okay, I don't have enough time in, in my, I wish you had in your, your testimony outlined you know, where, the, where the taxpayer's money has gone. Congressman, uh, can, can, I, can I address that? Uh, the last time great. I was here, we provided a, a very exhaustive document that showed exactly where all of the taxpayer money has gone. So of the $82 billion, $40 billion of TARP and roughly 42 or $43 billion of, of a loan from the Federal Reserve, it's a very exhaustive analysis that breaks it down into how much went to the counterparties, how much went to municipalities to protect the, the guaranteed investment contracts, how much went to uh, pay off debt that was called because we'd lost our ratings, how much went to securities lending. There's a very exhaustive analysis that's a part of the record that explains that in some detail. We, we, we aren't trying to obfuscate anything. We thought we had already provided that. And if you'd like, we'll provide you another copy of it. I think it'll answer all your questions. Well, I, I think when we, when we title this hearing, Where Did the Money Go?, and we, we send you an invitation and we say, tell us, tell us what you did with the federal financial assistance, I think that sort of is asking that. And so yes. now we have this hearing and we have you up here and we don't have any response. And that, you know, that, that bothers me to no end. You know? we'll, We're we'll, going to have to have you back up here. I'm, I'm, not gonna, you know, I'm, with, I'm with Kucinich on this. We're not going to be rolled on this. And, and when we ask you a question and we get all these people together and we have a hearing and we ask you a specific question to address on your, your testimony, by God, we want the answer. We own 80% of your company. You, you exist because the American taxpayer purchased 79.9% you know, of your shares. And so there's, a, there's, a, there's an obligation due here. There's, there's, there's a transparency that's, that's owed to the American taxpayer. And we don't see it. And, and it, is, it is particularly frustrating. Uh, let me ask you. I, I did see some of the counterparty uh, obligations here that uh, when the first uh, money went into, uh, went into AIG, uh, one of the top beneficiaries was uh, Goldman Sachs mm -hmm. at, at $12.4 billion. Now, the person who arranged that deal was, was uh, Secretary Paulson, who was formerly of, of, uh, you know, uh, associated with that firm. Did you feel any, any uh, pressure or anything in terms of the order in which you had to uh, compensate or, or uh, uh, provide, provide those funds to those individual firms? Did you feel any uh, conflict there? I did not. And the final resolution, the final determination of who got what was made by the Federal Reserve, not by people at AIG. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that explains a lot. Okay. Well, again, I, I'm, I'm going to ask that, uh, that the committee uh, – re-invite you to another hearing at which you actually uh, can, can get into that central question of where the taxpayer money went. Maybe we could do that in conjunction with Mr. Kucinich and the questions he had. Uh, but at this point, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will, Congressman, I will provide to you uh, within the next couple of days a fresh copy of what we provided the, the previous committee that I was at, which, which gives, goes into great detail as to where the money went. Thank you very much. Um, gentleman from past, okay. Congressman Conley from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and welcome, Mr. Liddy. Um, a couple of questions. Um, your predecessor, Mr. Greenberg, testified before this committee a few weeks ago, uh, and he indicated that uh, he would now favor federal regulation of uh, credit default swap instruments and derivatives for that matter. Do you share that opinion that uh, the federal government needs to regulate those financial instruments? Yeah, I think they need to be put on an exchange. I think they need to be standardized and it needs to be a lot more transparency. And if there was federal regulation, you would get all of those. And if I understood your testimony this morning, Mr. Liddy, uh, you believe that in retrospect where AIG went wrong was frankly uh, branching out into such financial instruments in the form of AIGFP specifically? Yes, those instruments are more appropriate for large commercial banks and investment banks that have the skill sets, a more refined skill set to handle them. It's not appropriate for an insurance company in my judgment. Right. Could you just review for me the figures I thought I heard you give in your testimony this morning? How much did AIG get pumped into the company directly from appropriated dollars from this body? And how much came directly from the Federal Reserve? Uh, as we stand right now, the money that's been advanced to the, uh, to the company is $40 billion out of TARP, out of the Treasury program, and a 40, about a $43 billion in loans from the Federal Reserve. Gotcha. Now, in addition to that, let me just finish. In addition to that, there's another $30 billion of TARP that we can draw on if we need it. And there's an additional uh, $17 billion to top the $43 billion off to 60 that we could draw from a, a, as a loan from the Federal Reserve. Okay. Thank you. Now, with respect to governance, if I understand it correctly, there are three federally appointed trustees? Yes. All of them are appointed by the Federal Reserve. Is that correct? Y you, you should ask them. Uh, I'm, they represent Treasury as the owner of the 79-9. I think they were appointed by the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve was delegated that responsibility by Treasury, but I'm not involved in that process. Right. <laughs> but with respect to their government, I mean, their names are Con Jill Considine, Chester Feldberg, and Douglas Foshi. Th that ring a bell? Yes. Yes. Those are all Federal yeah. Reserve appointees, are they not? Yes. But, I, but I, I'm sorry, where I'm stumbling because I don't, I'm just not involved in it is I think they represent the Treasury's interest the ownership interest of you say you're and, not involved um, in the selection and role of the uh, trustees. in the selection, but you certainly are involved in the interaction. With oh, absolutely, them. yes. Are there any other federal trustees? No. So, so for example, there are no elected officials or anyone appointed by this elected body as a trustee of AIG. No, certainly not that I'm aware of. Hmm. Um, they don't attend board meetings. Is that correct? They do not. The Federal Reserve has delegates at every board meeting and every committee meeting. And is the board still pretty much a private sector-like board? Uh, private well, what I'm asking is, uh, is there a clear delineation between the public trustees representing federal interests of almost 80 percent and the board of directors that apparently, I'm asking, stays pretty much privately controlled and appointed? There is a delineation, but again, the linchpin of that would be the representatives from the Federal Reserve who are observers and overseers at every board meeting, every committee meeting, every strategy meeting, every discussion that we have. So representatives of the Federal Reserve sit in on board meetings? Yes, they do. Gotcha. Unlike these trustees? Correct. What is the, going back to the governance question, what is the distinction then between the role of these trustees and those members of the Federal Reserve who sit in on board meetings overseeing that procedure? I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer, and then I think you should address that, uh, that to the trustees. The trustees are the protectors of the 79.9% ownership and the value that we'd like to create for that. The Federal Reserve is representing its interests as a lender and has in the past been asked by the Treasury to also kind of coordinate Treasury's interaction with the company so that there can be only one organization doing it instead of splitting it. We are we have 360 degree oversight with, with an awful lot of people wanting to understand what our strategy is, what our execution is. The Fed has been asked to try to coordinate that 360 degree oversight. Um, my time is probably running out, but let me ask a final question. With respect to bonuses, one of the rationales um, in the public record anyhow for bonuses was recruitment and retention. Um, how, how many folks, with respect to the bonuses in question, 
How many folks left the company? Um, Who received bonuses? Yeah, I, I would say very few. Now, are you talking about, and here's, here's where it's very easy to get off the track. You're talking about FP retention bonuses or overall company bonuses or what? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll gladly go with the FP bonuses for a minute. Uh, on, the, on the FP sector, uh, we had about maybe 10 to 12 to 15 resignations. Uh, we've had several of those people rescind those resignations and stay with us even as they work to return uh, their bonuses. Don't know if the resignations are, are over yet. Some have said, you know, I'm going to help you wind this down and be as professional as I can, but then I want to get on with my life and I want to, I want to resign. So I don't know that my answer is reflective of what will eventually happen. Uh, if, if it's possible to get us data for the record in terms of that list of people who qualified for bonuses or, and or got bonuses and what, how many of them left the company or stayed with the company. Okay. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Right. Chairman. I right. yield back. Thank you, Reverend. Yield five minutes to Mr. Westmoreland, gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Liddy, how many lawsuits are currently pending between AIG and CV Star, Star International, and or Mr. Hank Greenberg? Uh, I can't give you an exact number, but, but several, and there are several that are quite large. I try to keep a finger on the pulse of, of the largest ones, but then I rely upon our general counsel and our legal department to handle those issues. How much money has AIG spent on uh, these lawsuits and legal fees so far, and how long do you think this could go on, and how much money has AIG set aside or projected uh, for the future cost of these lawsuits? I don't have the details, sir. We can provide them to you, but I would say the largest, one of the largest lawsuits we have involves a, a lawsuit with, uh, with uh, SECO, and, and it has a, a $4 billion uh, potential recovery attached to it. And so working to get that money so that it can be used for the benefit of the taxpayers, we think makes some sense. Okay. And so, but, you know, from what I've been reading or told is that this could take three or four years and tens of millions of dollars to, uh, to, to get these lawsuits uh, settled that or with uh, CV Star or Mr. Greenberg or Star International? Well, the first of those lawsuits is scheduled to go to trial on uh, June 15th of this year. Okay. Uh, and I, the, the start of that lawsuit would go back to, oh, 2005, 2006. So an awful lot of work has already been done at it, done with respect to it. So the issue becomes, do you continue to pursue it? Because you're now very close to what you think will be a legal victory involving a fair amount of money. But that's one of the lawsuits. How, do you, you said you didn't know exactly how many are, are pending? No, that's one, I, I know that one because it's one of the larger. Then there's a suit uh, against Mr. Greenberg to the tune of about $1.6 billion to, re, to recover the fines and penalties that the company paid as a result of his behavior uh, that was determined. That's what we had to do in order to pay the, uh, the Attorney General of the State of New York. Okay. But you, you, you will get us the information about how many lawsuits are pending Yes, and, and where they're at in the legal process, if you with respect if you to don't Mr. Mind. Greenberg, yes, yeah. that would be fine. Um, according to the news reports, uh, and I want to ask you if this is true, uh, that Mr. Greenberg has offered to submit um, all these matters to a mandatory arbitration. Uh, are those news accounts true? Uh, we've we've gone through various forms of either mediation or arbitration in the past generally without any successful conclusion. And now that all the work has been done and this trial is ready to start and the judge who's going to hear it has been briefed and is knowledgeable on it, most of those activities are no longer ongoing. But we certainly have engaged in those discussions before. But, uh, well, I think my question is, are the news reports true that it would be mandatory arbitration? Uh, I, I, binding arbitration. Yeah, binding I, arbitration. I, I, I don't think so. No. Again, we're we're going to quickly exhaust my level of, of expertise in terms of exactly what that would be, and that's why. Well, could I, you could you get that information too to find out if these news reports are true yes. that it would be a binding arbitration that uh, that he has suggested that uh, he and AIG go through, because you know to be honest with you, Mr. Liddy, now that AIG is about 80 percent taxpayer owned. I would think that if this binding arbitration was an offer that was out there for both sides to do, that it might be uh, in the best interest of the American taxpayer to get these things settled rather than going on for years and years and years paying these legal fees. 
And uh, I'm sure that binding arbitration with whoever the arbiter would be um, could, in fact, in the end result, bring this to a close and save the taxpayers, myself, and my kids and grandkids uh, uh, millions of dollars over this period of time. You mentioned yourself that this has been going on since 2005 in this one case. And so if there's more than one case, how much longer could it go on? How much more money are we going to spend on lawyers? And what would be the harm in going to a binding arbitration? Well, as I said, we, we have attempted to do that on numerous occasions with Mr. Greenberg on, on at least one suit and probably, uh, and probably others. Uh, and now all of the work and effort has been, has been teed up to actually take this to trial. So uh, we think we have an excellent So you've chance never to been to binding arbitration is what you're saying? Uh, I'll, I'll provide you the detail. I just don't know. Okay, because, we, I mean, if you've been to binding arbitration, it looks like it would be binding. And I don't want to badger you, and I'm yeah, not no, trying I, to. I, but, I, I, just, I know, I I know we've like been to, through several well, rounds of mediation. I, I would like to know the details on that because I feel like since the, uh, you know, we now own 80 percent of the company that we do have an interest in that in an ongoing litigation that could cost millions of dollars. And Would but, the gentleman yield? I will. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Liddy, earlier I asked you about the current stock value of the, port you know, of your stock, but I didn't ask you about your portfolio in its entirety. As an enterprise value, what would you say the fairly stated enterprise value of the going concern you, you run today is? Not what you could liquidate it for, but what the enterprise value is, so that we could decide what you believe it is worth in a fair market, not what it's going to earn over years in which you get artificially low loans and, and stock which is paying no dividend, but what do you believe the enterprise is worth today? I would go back to the discussion we had earlier. I think it's the I think it's the equity value. It's about 2.7 billion shares. I think at approximately two dollars a share because it's not just the assets that you have to value. It's all the liabilities. It's the 40 billion dollars that we 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 well, want that, to that's pay That's why back. I asked for the enterprise There's 250 value. 250 billion dollars of other of other debt that we owe. So I think the enterprise value is is at most what the what the equity value is worth today. So you're saying you're worth five billion and you've got 190 billion of the stockholders' investment. Well, again, the key is to be able to manage this situation over time so that we can liquidate the liabilities, pay back everything, and then have a value retained, which the trustees are the, the guardians of. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. M Mr. Chairman, uh, and I'll yield back my time, but I would like to make a request that we do get this information uh, from Mr. Liddy and AIG as far as uh, uh, the future liability that could be imposed upon the taxpayers. Without objection, we hold the record open for the information. The gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Capture. I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Mr. Liddy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to place on the record as I begin my, my uh, questioning here the list of uh, the current board of directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York as well as the list of primary dealers with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the amount of funds that have been provided uh, to the uh, different institutions uh, that are primary dealers uh, as uh, being counterparties to some of the funds that were received uh, through AIG. Objection. I thank you. Uh, Mr. Liddy, uh, May I ask you, what is the actual address at which AIG is headquartered? 70 Pine Street. 70 what? Pine, P-I-N-E, in New York. P-I-N-E. Is that in New York City? Yes, it is. Okay. Where in New York City is it? Is it part of the Wall Street community? Yes, it's Lower Manhattan. It's Lower Manhattan. Who would be your closest financial neighbors there? Uh, the Federal Reserve is two blocks away. All right. Thank you. Uh, the American people have now given AIG nearly $200 billion, and I guess others have stated we own about 79.9% of AIG. Um, have you paid the taxpayers back any of the money that they have lent you to date? We have. We're required, whenever we sell an asset, we're required to take the proceeds of that asset to the extent it's not to the extent we can get out of the insurance companies or whatever, but whatever's been sold, we pay it back to the Federal Reserve. And how much have you paid back to the taxpayers of the United States? Um, several billion dollars. I don't have billion? the exact billion. Several yes. billion? Yes. So it was paid to the Federal Reserve. That doesn't necessarily mean it's deposited to Treasury to be refunded to the American people, I take it. Th that's correct. It's in satisfaction of the debt that we owe to the Federal Reserve. All right. Um, so could you, could you provide more accurate numbers 
dates and amounts returned to the Federal Reserve since yes. the original infusions to uh, AIG? And yes. could you also submit for the record a list of your board of directors, please? Sure. Thank you. Uh, next question. Approximately how much have you paid out uh, to your employees uh, in bonuses and dividends to your shareholders over the last six months? We've paid no dividends to shareholders. We're not allowed to do that. Uh, as soon as we uh, received help from the Federal Reserve, all dividends to the shareholders were uh, not allowed. Uh, bonuses. I, I, there's so many ways to slice this number. I, I just can't answer it. If you would give us the time, it's, it, if you give us the time to respond in writing, that's a better way to do that, and we will do that shortly. All right. Um, we would very much appreciate that as soon as you can give it to us. Um, let me ask you, of the funds AIG has been given uh, by the American people, 40 percent of it was then redirected to other Wall Street firms, as I understand it. And the largest recipient was Goldman Sachs uh, that received $12.9 billion. Is my understanding correct? Yes, there are two or three firms that received double digit, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 billion dollars in settlement of legal contracts. Yes. and. Uh, the, um, at least five of those that receive these funds are the worst offenders in the subprime uh, market, including uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, Chase, uh, Wachovia, Citigroup, HSBC, uh, Bank of America. It's very interesting to see who got funds when they're responsible for three quarters of the subprime mess in the housing market that this country is facing. Um, I would ask you uh, to um, use your power since you've given them money to get them to do loan workouts at the local level where citizens are outraged that companies like JP Morgan Chase which is the top of my at the top of my bad boys list for not returning phone calls thousands and thousands of families in places like Ohio are affected by their recalcitrance and arrogance and it offends me to see that they get money uh, and they perform so poorly um, but my question regards Goldman Sachs. Could you clarify your relationship with Goldman Sachs, uh, the largest recipient of these counterparty funds <clears throat> through AIG, $12.9 billion? What years did you serve as a member of the board of Goldman Sachs, please? I was on the board for approximately five and a half years. Don't remember the year exactly I went on, but I exited that, uh, that relationship as soon as I became the chairman and CEO of AIG back in September of 2008. September 2008. Is there a specific date? Uh, within a, tendered my resignation within, a, as soon as I could get to it, within a, a week or 10 days of my being appointed. Did you leave in early September or late September? Uh, it would be after September 18th, but before September 30th. After September 18th. Thank you. Is it true that you served as chairman of the audit committee of Goldman Sachs? I did for the last year of my service. All right, so you would have done that through middle to late September last year? Yes. All right. Bloomberg News reported on April 17th that you currently own 27,129 shares of Goldman Sachs stock. Is that true? Uh, yes. All right. Could you please estimate the market value of that to date? Uh, three plus million dollars. All right. And you currently hold that? No, I don't. It's three. I own about 8,000 shares outright, which I bought when Goldman Sachs went public in 19, 2000, 2001. And the rest of it uh, I received as compensation as a director. I did not take any cash. I took it in deferred stock. The deferred stock you can't get at until you retire from the board. And sometime in May or June that would be available to me. So it's been restricted. But in any case, you have a direct interest in Goldman Sachs. You have a financial interest in Goldman Sachs. And I understand you may also have some other type of agreement with them where you were paid some type of lump sum. I don't have any other type of uh, agreement. So your only yeah. interest would be the stock then, several million dollars. Yes. The gentlewoman's uh, time has expired. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, definitely. Congressman Souter, Souter from Indiana. Thank you. I'm going to yield to the ranking member in a minute. I didn't want to repeat questions because I was over at Homeland Security uh, earlier. But I, I have a qu question on the bonuses. What on bonuses at AIG, it, what percent of a normal uh, salary, typically before all this happened, would bonuses be? In other words, is it an integral part of someone's pay or is it intermittent? Is it a small amount, 5 percent? Is it? 
Um, <clears throat> it's literally all over the lot. There's 115,000 people who work at AIG, so typically that bonus as a percentage of your base would be lower uh, at the lower ends of the organization and higher as you work higher into the organization. And since, just like at Goldman Sachs, you were getting uh, uh, stock dividends, uh, that was as a trustee, did AIG give stock dividends or were they always cash? No, at AIG you could have a base salary, uh, you could have an annual performance bonus, and then it would be a long-term bonus. The long-term bonus would be stock, and you were expected, at the time, you were expected to hold that stock until you retired from the company, and if you left before you retired, you could lose it. And my uh, understanding as we've gone through these different hearings is the argument for the bonuses was is that we needed to retain personnel, uh, the company could fold and particularly keep personnel. Uh, is that... Now, Again, not the last round on the, the legal argument, but this has been going on. AIG has had these problems way back before December. Uh, and the question is, is that in the bonus round, part of the feeling was, and what my question is to follow that, and you can explain if that's not true, is, is that um, right now there's not a lot, of, whole lot of other types of jobs uh, available. Uh, certainly uh, with the resume coming off of some of the problems at AIG, it would be a very difficult time to, to do that. Uh, in my district, we're getting hammered by unemployment. They're looking at the bonuses. They're saying, we don't, we don't get bonuses when our company goes down. We get laid off. Uh, that, uh, and, and it becomes uh, problematic as to why AIG would need the bonuses to retain personnel, why AIG would be paying such huge bonuses when uh, companies, I have some companies in my district where bonuses can be 40% of their normal salary, and they're not getting any bonuses. Uh, what, why is it unique in, in your industry and firm? Uh, they're like commissions, uh, uh, and, and uh, I'd just like to hear a little bit more of an explanation, because I don't know how, sure. I don't know how to ex explain it, because I haven't ha heard a good explanation that anybody's buying. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, think, I think we need to be careful with how we use that word bonus because it can, it can represent so many different things and it's what's caused members of this committee some frustration. So let me see if I, can, if I can quickly explain it. There are normal annual performance bonuses. If you do a good job on this, in addition to your salary, you'll get 15, 20, 25, 40 percent over and above that. So I guess you could look at it as a commission, but it's in our industry. Uh, it, it really is a, it's a performance-based bonus. That was earlier in, the, earlier in the day we had the conversation about that totaled about 450 some million dollars paid over the entire breadth of our company and against a payroll of some seven and a half to eight billion dollars uh, in size. So that's one form of a bonus, <clears throat> a performance of uh, an annual variable pay or a performance bonus. Then uh, there were retention bonuses put in place. I think the ones you're referring to are at AIGFP. They were designed in 2007, put in place in 2008, uh, and we, when we decided and knew that we were going to wind that business down, we asked people to stay, to not leave until they accomplished certain things, sell a book of business, uh, make it less risky. To the extent they did that, they were paid a retention bonus or an award, again, for some level of performance. So it depends upon which area of so that you're, you're really like, poking at. In other words, I understand the basic uh, choices. I've been in the middle of companies before I came to Congress that had all those different ranges. Sometimes things like annual performance bonuses don't become performance bonuses. They become expected. And, and that, uh, that my question is, is, so were dividends, yet your dividends are zero. So at what, why would the company have made decisions to continue uh, at any level things that are supposed to be performance-based. Did you have a big exodus of employees at different times? Uh, in, indeed, was it critical to the survival of the company? Because it seems odd that you were saying to the people who invested, many of whom were trust funds and retired people, people who owned that, that you get nothing, but we're going to continue things that are supposed to be performance-based when the performance of AIG was not good for an extended period of time, not just well, the last few months. I think, Congressman, you have to break it down into pieces so the total performance of the business as a whole may not have looked good because it was severely damaged by one or two enterprises. Uh, but good. then there were a host of other enterprises that performed well. And to the extent those people who work in those businesses earned those performance bonuses, they would have been paid. If they didn't earn them, they would have gotten zero. The gentleman's time has expired. It's an interesting thing that people with the stock didn't get treated the same way. Thank you very much. Uh, gentleman from Rhode Island. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman Kennedy. Welcome, Mr. Liddy. 
Um, I think uh, you obviously heard a great deal of frustration from many uh, people here because obviously uh, we represent our constituents who uh, are undergoing a great deal of economic struggle and uh, as you no doubt understand uh, yourself um, are very frustrated just with their own economic circumstance and after having seen the travails of uh, the financial system are questioning the very basic foundation of our financial system in every form and that's the reason why um, these questions uh, seem so directed at, at you but please understand we understand that your goal is to try to uh, get the best deal possible for the taxpayer and believe me in doing so it'll be for the best interest of all of our constituents mm -hmm. that um, AIG uh, is able to pay back the taxpayer and uh, certainly I think um, all of us are interested in that uh, and uh, certainly taking your expertise to be able to do that will be something that we're all interested in seeing fruit being fruitful and successful. Um, one of the things that I think will be um, of great deal of concern, I know, for uh, all of our constituents down the road, um, as you've heard echoed over and over again with respect to these bonuses, is this notion of uh, the transparency. And when you started in your remarks <coughs> talking about how, you know, AIG is the parent company and you talked about um, these separ separating off various other entities from AIG. Um, I think that what it raised in, in terms of questions with respect to Project Destiny and how you're going to move forward is um, when we uh, as a Congress passed um, limitations um, on, you know, future uh, bonuses, you know, from uh, being used out of the TARP, uh, the question is, is whether these future, um, if you will, special purpose vehicles, um, these separate entities that are no longer part of quote unquote AIG proper are going to be considered um, TARP recipients for purposes of uh, the rules and governance of uh, these bonuses. And, um, and as such, you know, all I know is that if my constituents here a couple of years down the line, that uh, there's uh, a subsidiary of a, a TARP recipient whose CEO is pulling down some huge bonus, albeit it's a successful subsidiary and, you know, it's helping to kick back the dollars that we need for the taxpayers overall, it, it's just going to drive them nuts. And so what I need to get an answer from you on is, is are these kind of separate companies, um, are they going to be um, under the same governance um, for purposes of uh, the TARP regulations that AIG is under? If they're still owned by AIG and a part of AIG, yes, it's our understanding they, they absolutely will be. There'll come a point in time when they're completely disassociated from, I, from AIG. They're totally separate companies. That'll be a good day because that means we will have gotten dollars and we've used those dollars <clears throat> to repay the federal government, either the loan to the Federal Reserve <clears throat> or the TARP dollars. I suspect when that occurs, because they will not be TARP related at all, then, they'd, then they would not be subject to it. But that would be a good thing. As long as they're owned by AIG and a part of AIG and AIG is subject to TARP dollars, then the subsidiary and pieces of AIG are subject to it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just... Uh call your attention to, to this. I think it's, it's going to be a, a fine line where we're going to have to watch because I guarantee it's going to come back and uh, bite us all in the behind if we're not careful in terms of what constitutes something that's owned by AIG or something that's now no longer part of AIG because it's been spun off by AIG. American people aren't going to look at it so, so clearly as uh, you know, maybe lawyers might, and uh, we're all going to be in in the soup uh, politically if uh, we're not careful. And I, I just would like to make sure that um, we're very sensitive to that, um, for purposes of the fact that down the road, 
we're going to need to go back to the taxpayer on occasion to get the, them to, um, you know, have their confidence in their federal government. And if they don't have confidence that we were true to our word um, at the beginning, uh, and if they perceive that there was some kind of uh, uh, shades of gray here that were, uh, you know, held back uh, and not fully forthcoming, they, they're going to feel as if uh, nothing was on the level. And I just worry about the kind of perception that it's going to create in terms of future efforts on our part to get any kind of uh, support in the future for our financial uh, system, which, of course, as you know, has been key to our being able to recover the confidence that we needed in order to keep this financial system from going completely belly up. Um, right. I'd also time. like to ask just in The gentleman's time has expired. Okay. The gentleman's time has expired. Thanks. Congressman Turner. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Ranking member, I appreciate your continued focus on the issue of, of uh, the uh, financial crisis that we've had and how that we um, look further into uh, holding people accountable. Uh, my community has been significantly impacted by the mortgage foreclosure crisis, which was a precursor of the financial meltdown that we saw uh, in our financial uh, industry. My, um, my primary county in my district of Montgomery County, with a population of approximately around 500,000, since I have been in Congress for six and a half years, has had 27,000 foreclosures. 27,000 foreclosures in an area of about 500,000 people. Uh, most recently, last week, this Congress moved forward with uh, calling for a commission that would look at the mortgage foreclosure crisis and its contributions to the uh, financial crisis. When the financial crisis was, was first identified, there was a discussion of the issue of toxic assets, uh, which people described as mortgage-backed securities. And we know that AIG had issues with mortgage-backed securities and also credit default swaps that were related to mortgage-backed securities. From the experience in my community where we had the mortgage foreclosure crisis, what we saw, what those individuals at um, our Fair Housing Lending Center saw and others who tried to impact this and to uh, assist uh, families that were going through it, is that the loan-to-value ratio of loans that, that the families received predominantly through refinancing, um, started with the family being underwater, meaning that the value of the loan that the family was given exceeded the value of the property. I'm from Ohio. We're not an area that has had wild speculation in property values or in, um, in escalation, modest uh, appreciation. So the, a loan-to-value ratio where you're underwater, where you start the loan underwater, structurally is a loan that, that, if there's any difficulty at all, is going to go to foreclosure. Um, the asset, of course, is, is not valued high enough to, uh, to back the loan as collateral. Um, and, and the family is left with leaving the home, sometimes to abandonment uh, and to the financial institutions. This commission that's moving forward is going to take a look at, one, at this issue. It's going to take a look at the issue is how do we get into this, this, this problem, uh, the, the mortgages that were, were, were granted. Um, and I believe that what we're going to see is probably the largest theft or fraud in history, where there was a systematic effort to give people loans that either exceeded the value of their property or were in such a high loan-to-value ratio that the, um, the loan itself was likely to result in foreclosure. So, sir, what I want to ask you is, is I'm looking for documents where our financial institutions had knowledge or knew that this process was happening. I believe that if there are mortgage-backed securities that were issued where the issuers knew that the collateral was insufficient to support the value of the loan, that that's fraud. I believe that if, um, that if the loan-to-value ratios are not disclosed to the subsequent purchasers, that it affects the very level of the risk for the mortgage-backed security and therefore, I think that also is, is fraud. And it certainly affects the, the value of the underlying mortgage and the suspicion that it would have a higher likelihood for default. Now, I understand you have a very big organization, but I am assuming that somewhere along the way, someone in your organization, an analyst, um, someone who is reviewing the processes 
of the um, trading of mortgage-backed securities, the issuing of them, the issuing of mortgages, someone who was looking at this may have brought to the attention of the company or others that there was a problem with the loan-to-value ratios that were being um, that were being packaged and then traded. Because I can tell you in my community, on the ground, the problem existed. So my question to you is, has everyone, anyone ever discussed this issue with you that there was a problem with the loan-to-value ratio of the underlying mortgages in, in, inherent in the mortgage-backed securities that were subject to credit default swaps? And also, would you be willing to share with this committee, for the purposes of sharing with, this, with the commission that's going to be impaneled, any documents or information that you have where there is a discussion of how that loan-to-value ratio uh, affects the level of risk for the mortgage-backed securities with it being out of whack. In other words, any documents that you have where someone says, I have a concern that this loan-to-value ratio is such that the loan exceeds the value of the asset, that the collateral is insufficient to support the value of the, of the loan, the mortgage, and that that lack of collateral value and that excessive loan-to-value ratio affects the level of risk for these mortgage-backed securities and therefore their ultimate value? <clears throat> yes, <clears throat> I would add, I'd add one thing to what you just said. In AIG's, particularly AIG FP's situation, we insured those values. So it wasn't just one individual home. They all went into a pool and, and different institutions would aggregate those pools. So what would come out of it, you'd have 100,000 loans. So you didn't get to look at the loan to value ratio at each one of those. You'd look at the rating. Many of those were rated AAA by the rating agencies. And when, when the AIG FP people underwrote them, they took at face value that they were AAA rated. So we have some of the same angst over the situation as you do. We'll, we'll help you in, in whatever way you'd like and whatever way we can. I just, I just caution you that we're kind of down at the bottom of that food chain as well. And by the time we looked at these things, they had been aggregated to a point where we didn't look at loan to value ratios on an individual right. house. We looked at them at a, at a whole pool of items. So we may not be a source of information that you're seeking. If we are, we'll help you with it. But we could be a source of, uh, at, at a minimum, uh, equally frustrated because we assumed, we took at face value that these were AAA rated, they were not. Well, and that's, that's why I'm asking for your help because yeah. if we have this commission impaneled and they're given the responsibility to look at it, this is going to be like pulling threads to get to what was, I, I believe, ultimately a systematic process for this to occur and you might have information that help leads us in the right direction. Yeah, if, we do, we'll be, if we do, we'll be delighted to share it with you. Gentlemen, Thank you time so much. has expired. Uh, the gentlewoman from California, Congresswoman Spire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Liddy, for appearing before the committee and answering our questions. Let me just, um, at the outset, underscore something you've said now a couple of times today and once before at the hearing before the Financial Services Committee. And in one way or another, you said AIG should return to its core uh, operations, to its knitting, as you put it. Um, that would suggest that we should reinstate the Glass-Steagall Act, doesn't it? I'm, I'm not sure if we should go back to it, but we should sure have a very rigorous debate about whether, we've, whether what we've allowed to happen has gone too far. Well, you, by your own admission today, said you should never have been involved in derivatives. It was Glass-Steagall that gave you the opportunity to get involved in derivatives. Had you been just an old-fashioned insurance company with reserves that you had to maintain, none of this would have happened, correct? Oh, with respect to, to AIG and, and our insurance operations versus AIG FP, correct. But I, I don't necessarily, my response to you was meant to suggest, I don't necessarily know that I would generalize from our situation to the overall uh, Glass-Steagall situation. All right, let's, um, let's kind of talk about where we are. When Secretary Paulson came before us, he said, we're going to get all of our money back from AIG. In fact, we'll make money. We, go, we spent a lot of time around here talking about a 79 percent interest that we own AIG, except for the fact that we have no say. And that's the big problem. The taxpayers are absolutely apoplectic about the fact that there are hundreds of bonuses of a million dollars or more given to AIG employees who brought this company down and the taxpayers are picking up the tab. Now, my question to you is, on the heels of what um, the, the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, asked earlier, can we really ever expect 
that the taxpayers are going to be repaid. I mean, if in fact you're talking about $70 billion in TARP money, another $50 billion uh, that we paid for Maiden Lane, another $60 billion in a loan uh, from the Fed, and you're worth $5 billion. I mean, we've all got to be scratching our heads. How can you possibly repay the taxpayers? Well, the $5 billion is, what, is what's worth after you've sold many of the good assets and paid off many of your liabilities, including the Federal Reserve and all the other debt that we have. So some of the businesses that I've mentioned in the course of our discussion today, a business like AIA, it, it's probably got a, a value of $25 billion. Uh, a business like Alico, it probably has a business of a, a value of 18. Our property casualty business has a book value of 35 or 38 billion dollars. So you just keep going down the list, and there's there's great opportunity for the taxpayer to be repaid. But sorry to be repetitive, it's very much a function of what happens to the economy and what happens to the capital markets. How much did uh, the financial products unit? pay in taxes, or did it pay anything in taxes since it, since it was located in London? Yeah, the taxes would have been, their earnings would have been added in with all the other earnings of the businesses that comprise AIG to get an aggregate number, and we would have paid taxes to the appropriate jurisdiction on that aggregate number. So I, if, if, it's, if that's important to you, we'll, we'll get you the number in terms of what we've paid in taxes over the last couple of years, but AIGFP would have just been a, been a piece of it. But if it was located in London, I mean, it could have been a tax haven for AIG, could it not? And all of the profits just retained in AIGFP and not brought back to the United States and therefore taxes not paid on it? Yeah, it would depend upon where those taxes were recognized. And, and as we sit here right now, I, I just don't have the would answer to that. you report back to the committee on precisely how mm -hmm. much AIG paid in total in taxes and then if, in fact, mm -hmm. AIGFP um, paid any taxes at all? The GAO uh, recently came out with a report in April recommending that all the contracts be renegotiated regarding uh, executive compensation at AIG uh, if and when the $30 billion was sought by AIG. Uh, I presume you've seen that report, and I'd like you to comment on it. You know, we are trying to do that in many cases, uh, particularly with respect to FP. We're going back to the contractual arrangements that were entered into at the end of 07, beginning of 08. They call for retention payments in 2010. We are working now to restructure those payments to make them more performance oriented. We're going to comply with whatever the rules and regulations are that come out when the Treasury promulgates them. And I guess my final question, although my time is now up, I will yield back. Thank you very much, Abby. We're not going to have a second round, but if you have a question, I will recognize you to uh, ask your question. Yeah, yeah. Congressman Kucinich. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Chairman, Mr. Liddy. The AIG uh, had a filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission recently in which was included a letter uh, that you sent to individuals who uh, were to receive bonuses. Uh, if, if you need, uh, I have a, a, a copy of the, uh, of the letter to refresh your memory. Now, now in this letter, uh, this, this letter, by the way, was sent four days after you became the CEO became the CEO on the 18th. The letter was <coughs> sent on the 22nd. It was uh, a little more than a week after uh, AIG received $85 billion from, from the Fed. And what you, um, uh, what you write, uh, and, and after you call for transparency, you, you wrote a letter to um, employees who are disclosing the company's recent SEC report saying, Quote, as this special award is being made to a very select group of executives, I ask that you treat it as confidential. Um, the letter goes on to assure this select group that in the event the AIG entity that is your employer, the company, experiences a change in control, that is consummation of a merger, consolidation, statutory share exchange, or similar form of corporate transaction involving the sale or other disposition, 
of all or substantially of any of all or substantially all of the company's assets to an entity that is not an affiliate of the company. AIG guarantees the payment of the 2008 special retention cash, a special cash retention award, on the dates and under the conditions specified above. Uh, my question to you, sir. Uh, first of all, you, you are familiar with that letter, are you, are you not? I, I haven't read it in quite a while, so I'm, I'm familiar with the issue, yes. Okay. Uh, is it, uh, based on that letter, is it true that, uh, that even if the United States took over AIG 100 percent, that, uh, that these bonuses uh, would be awarded? No, in fact, uh, many of them have not. Many of them have been restructured or they've been, the payment of, has, of them has been delayed and we're looking at revising them and trying to figure out how, how do we pay them, how do we keep people that we need to run these businesses, uh, but how do we honor both the spirit and the intent of what comes out with the Treasury regulations? So, so you're telling this committee uh, that it is the position of, of AIG management, of which you're the CEO, uh, that this letter that you sent that's part of your SEC filing is no longer operative. No, it's, it's, it's what causes us such difficulty, Congressman. We have that letter, which can be viewed as a contract, but we have a new set of events which says it's going to take a lot longer to pay back the American taxpayer. How do we balance those two? How do we balance a commitment that we made with the understanding that we have right now that the fact that it's going to take us longer to repay the American taxpayer? It's, it's difficult. We need the leadership of this business, of our businesses, if we're going to keep them viable, sell them, and pay back the taxpayer. So that's, that's where there's great tension in the system right now. How do, you, how do you keep the leadership, pay them competitive wages, honor a commitment like that, but still be responsive to whatever new legislation uh, is put in place. So, so do you intend to honor the commitment that you made in the letter? I'm going to wait to see what, what comes forward uh, from, from the Treasury to see if <laughs> those kinds of uh, payments are permitted, if they need to be restructured, if they need to be uh, more performance-based. I just don't have enough information to, to answer the question. And I'm told that those rules and regulations will be forthcoming in a number of weeks. Will you be able to let this committee know uh, whether or not you intend to uh, honor the letter that says that you're going to pay uh, bonuses to, uh, uh, to people, essentially that they'd be able to collect bonuses uh, at taxpayers' expense, even if uh, AIG, even if the government has a bigger stake? Yes, many of those dollars, if to the extent they go to people that are senior executives, that would have to be reported. We'd have to make an 8K filing or a 10Q filing. You'll know it. Well, because the reason why I ask if we'd know, Mr. Chairman, is because you'd asked uh, the previous recipients of this letter to keep the matter confidential. So are we, are we to expect an, uh, a more forthcoming approach, more transparency in the dealings with this committee, or are you going to have confidential relationships with your employees to pass on bonuses to them without this committee being aware of it? No, we intend to be very yeah. transparent in everything that we do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, let me just say this before I recognize uh, Congressman Turney. You know, uh, Mr. Liddy, I, I hope you recognize what people in the street are saying. You know, like when I go home to Brooklyn, they're saying, how do you pay a person, give them a bonus when they have failed? They put us in this mess, and now you're going to give them a bonus for it. I mean, I don't know how we answer people when we hear that. So I think that you need to really keep that in mind as you move forward, because that's the thing that the people out there are so angry about. And then, the, of course, when they say it's a retention, you know, they said, why would you want to retain them? You know, and that's what we're hearing in the street. And I don't know whether or not, you know, uh, uh, you're getting this as you talk to people, but that's the thing that we're really, really, really getting. And then the other one is that they say to us, you know, uh, why would you give them you know, retention bonus, uh, first of all, they fail, and the fact that the economy is so messed up, where can they go? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are the issues that are being raised. So I just think, you know, so you can sort of get a feel from our frustration up here as we deal with our constituents in terms of how we answer this. And, and believe me, um, that's an issue that's been raised, uh, you know, day in and day out. I yield to the congressman from Massachusetts. Congressman Thank you, uh, Mr. Liddy, when uh, Hank Greenberg was in front of this committee, I, I asked him whether or not he believed that AIG should have been allowed to go bankrupt or whether they should have been bailed out, and his answer was that he thought 
uh, that the company should have been allowed to go bankrupt, that there was not a created a systemic problem. Uh, what's your response to that? What do you believe to be the case? Uh, I wasn't there when that decision was made, neither was Hank, so oh, that was a decision that, that the Treasury and Federal Reserve made. You know, as I examine the situation, I think it would not have been good if it had gone bankrupt. And the reason I think that is, first, the institutional shock wave at that time. I mean, those were dark days in the middle of September when people were very concerned about the, the survivability of the worldwide financial system. So we'd had Fannie and Freddie being taken over. We'd had uh, Bear Stearns uh, several months before that. We had WAMU. We had uh, the failure of Lehman Brothers. I think if AIG had gone bankrupt, it really would have sent shock waves through the system. So I think the passage of time has led me to conclude it would not have been a good idea to do that. AIG also, not just institutionally, from a, a retail standpoint, an individual customer standpoint, we have 81 million policies, uh, life insurance, pensions, uh, retirement and savings plans. The, the difficulty of managing something that large in 130 different countries, regulated by 400 regulators, would have been something the world has never seen. So I, I think it would have, would have created uh, much more difficulty than the current situation that we find ourselves in would have. And yet we could still end up there. Uh, you know, we have a plan that we don't think uh, uh, puts us there. You, you just, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, as I've said many times, the, we are so dependent upon what happens with the economic recovery and what happens with the values of our assets, which are driven by the capital markets. Uh, we think we have a plan that prevents that. It's a good plan. It takes time to, to uh, implement. Okay. I, I just note there's a distinction probably between that would not have been good, which I think the way you phrased it, and whether or not uh, it still should have been allowed to go bankrupt because, you know, no bankruptcy situation is good. The question really would have been would have been catastrophic or would have been systemic. Yes. And your belief is that it would have. I, I think it would have been catastrophic and systemic. As I said, the, the folks that had to make that decision, they were making that decision not in a vacuum, but in the context of an awful lot of other moving pieces. And people, I think, were genuinely afraid of the damage that an AIG bankruptcy could do on top of the heels of a Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, yes, Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, going back to Goldman Sachs, Mr. Liddy, as a member of the board of Goldman Sachs through last September, were you involved in any of the meetings or discussions leading up to the disposition of Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns during which, uh, during, uh, which time advice was given to Treasury Secretary Paulson, the former chairman of Goldman Sachs, on those institutions' disposition? Yes, anything that would have transpired before whenever I resigned, which I think is the 23rd, 24th, 25th, if there were board meetings on those, on those subjects, I would have participated in those board meetings. Yes, and how would we obtain minutes of those meetings and a full understanding of your role? Uh, you, I don't keep any records like that. You'd have to go to the Goldman Sachs uh, General Counsel and ask them for that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would very much like to ask that the committee use its subpoena power to obtain those records. Um, let me ask this. Uh, today there are many people staffing you. Uh, we recognize some of their faces. And I'm wondering uh, if, for the record, uh, those individuals who currently are working for AIG directly or on contract to AIG could stand up in the audience and provide, uh, for the record, the organizations or firms for which they work in the terms of their contract. Could those individuals that are currently under contract or working directly for AIG, could you please stand up? Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? All right, I'd appreciate it very much if those firms and the contracts could be made a part of the public record, Mr. Chairman. With, I have. Um, without objection, so on. I thank the gentleman very much. And I have two additional requests for information. One, <clears throat> Mr. Liddy, can you provide for the record the names of individuals who. Uh, in late 1998 or thereabouts, uh, worked for and ran the AIG Financial Products Division, created it actually, uh, and developed and issued the first credit default swaps, and also any internal documents related to the initiation and development of AIG's credit default swap uh, and derivative activity from its inception. Congresswoman, what, what was the year? I'm sorry, the year was? When it started. You referenced the year 1998. Oh, AIG FP started in 1987. All right. Uh, when did the credit default swap piece of it get started? Uh, 
Well, I'll have to get you the exact date. I understand your request, so whenever they start... I want the historical you. development of that division. It appears to be very important. When you appeared before Congress a couple weeks ago, you said only 20 people worked for that division. Is that possible? No. There's there were 400 people in that division. The folks that worked in the credit default swap area, there were probably 20 of them. There were only three or four who designed the multi-sector credit default swaps that caused us the difficulty that we were well, in. Well, I think it's important for us to unwind back to the beginning what happened. So we would look for the information about that inside of AIG. And um, if it goes back to 1987, then let's see when it morphed and when it became something other than what it was originally and who actually did that. I understand, did that occur in England or in this country, the actual creation of the idea to do that? I think there were some people in, I, I think Mr. Greenberg started it in 1987, and then it got ramped up to a greater extent in the late 90s and early 2000s, and it would have been simultaneously in Connecticut and London. I think it's very important for us to understand what happened. And um, I think seeing who worked for that instrumentality inside of AIG from inception through the morphing that happened after Glass-Steagall's uh, upturning by this Congress would be most interesting. Also, um, to provide for the record all materials your firm possesses on the $2.2 .2 billion diverted to Dresdner Kleinwert in Germany, and uh, particularly the financial assessments made to justify their receipt of funds. How does Dresdner Kleinwert get uh, involved in all this, particularly since they are uh, have been in deep trouble in Germany and are being acquired by Commerce Bank and by Allianz Insurance Group in Germany. Um, very interested in how you got involved in Dresdner Kleinwerk. Do you wish to comment for the record on that at this point? No, that was all before my time. I don't have any, any sense of it at all. All right. It's so my understanding that Dresdner Kleinwerk, through some process I would like to unravel, became the possessor um, of a great deal of subprime housing paper from this country. I would like to know how it was transferred to them, through which firms, in what years, and what caused them to collapse. Yeah, I just don't know that we have any information on that whatsoever. To the extent we had a relationship with them, we'll provide you the material. Well, you've given them $2.2 billion. Right. You must have yeah. some kind of relationship yeah, with them. Yeah, but I would assume that will be in satisfaction of some sort of a, of a credit default swap contract or what have you. But all the other information, you know, how, how much did they participate in subprime lending, we, we wouldn't have that information. Uh, General, who would have time that? Is expired. Were, you, were you ordered to give them the $2.2 bill, uh, $2 billion by the Federal Reserve? The Federal Reserve, when we set up Maiden Lane 3, took responsibility for the settlement of all of those credit default swap contracts. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Liddy. Uh, boy, I've got a couple of, of, of ones that I know are sort of like you've heard before. But what I wanted to say first was please consider taking this $400 plus million in bonuses, breaking it down, not necessarily just for one member, but for the public, into those people who were generating EBIT in sections of the company that are, that are providing positive cash flow and positive EBIT. And, and let people understand that these are performers who are delivering real value who should be rewarded because you need that profit as part of your going concern. And then whatever's left, we can argue about. But, I, but I'm hoping for the sake of all of us on the dais and for the public, we make it very clear that even in a company that's having bad times, even when a car dealership is only selling 12 cars, you still pay a commission to the guy that sold 11 of them. Okay, and you pay a bonus to the guy that sold 11 out of the 12 cars. Exactly right. So to the extent that you have those individuals, whatever percentage, whatever dollars, I think those performers, maybe not by name, but by category, should be identified so the American people don't see a big number and assume that this was all just a giveaway. Uh, it's been too long in business to not appreciate your problem of keeping good people that can keep the ship afloat, particularly the ones that are producing, in divisions that are producing. I want to get to one closing set of questions, though. Uh, former, your predecessor, I guess two ago, Mr. Greenberg, when he came to us, he not only told us that you should have filed bankruptcy, but he basically led me to believe that you had an obligation to file bankruptcy. The Treasury had an obligation. Everyone had an obligation. When you stopped being a, when you had a going concern opinion, you stop working for the stockholders and you start working for the secured creditors. That's just a reality of your board. 
that as a viable going concern, you maximize stockholder value. As soon as you are not a going concern, you have to look to your in order preferred creditors, secured creditors, and you have an obligation to them. Mr. Greenberg led us to believe, and I've checked with bankruptcy experts, and it appears he's right, that tens of billions of dollars were paid out that had your firm filed bankruptcy would not have been paid because the corpus that was bankrupt was firewalled from other parts of the company. Therefore, yes, FP would have gone bankrupt. It would have delivered whatever assets it had. Other claims against the company to the extent they existed would have been cleared in bankruptcy. But huge parts, some of the very companies you're talking about that have large value would have been firewalled from that. How do you respond to that? I think the regulators in those uh, 130 countries that we do business would have grabbed those, would have grabbed those insurance assets and would have held on to them and wouldn't have released them to anybody. And there would have been a very substantial debate internationally about who owned and who controlled those assets. So what you're saying is you couldn't count on the rule of law, so that's why the Treasury ordered you to pay monies to people like Goldman Sachs, who you did, you paid with dollars that were put in to the corpse and paid out of the corpse in excess of any kind of value that it had, but are burdened to the parent company around what otherwise would have been a firewall. Well, once a decision was made not to declare bankruptcy, that sets in motion a whole series of events. You have to honor the contracts. The Federal Reserve decided that we should pay 100 cents on the dollar, that 100 cents on the dollar should be paid in the settlement of those various... Right, uh, but these were, these were credit default swaps that I could have bought for a fraction of that on an open market to the extent that somebody was floating them at the time, right? So we paid more than their current value at the time we paid them off. I believe that's what the Federal, Federal Reserve decided was in the best okay. interest of the financial system. So the Federal Reserve paid a premium. I just want to make sure we have it because we have three trustees we're entrusting with our money going forward. The Federal Reserve paid a known premium, and they paid it not to FP, so that we're all talking about FP, where they paid it to the parent company and caused you to take onto your balance sheet and your stockholders to be diluted based on a decision the Treasury made for you not to file bankruptcy and, in fact, for you to, to go down their way. And as you said, they made the decision. You, had, you got your instructions from the Fed. And, and Treasury. Is that, that's what you've said here, right? Well, the Federal Reserve, it's not just getting instructions. The Federal Reserve handled those discussions and negotiations to settle right. those counterparties. So the question I'm going to be asking the trustees going forward, because they're in a similar situation, but a little different than you, your board and you were, had an independent responsibility to your stockholders, the now 20 percent used to be 100 percent, and to other creditors that when, you, when the decision was made outside of your company not to go into bankruptcy and the decision was made to take all of the assets otherwise not encumbered in a normal firewalled situation and put them in, your company today, whatever it's worth, owes this money to the Treasury, to the American people, but it owes it based on decisions that were made that were not prudent on their face for your company. May have been prudent for the world, may have been prudent for the financial markets, but they weren't prudent for your company in the ordinary course of you get to make the decision. Well, Congressman, it could turn out that they were very prudent. It's all a matter of whether at the end of this whole situation we're able to pay back the, the uh, American public all the money that's been either loaned to or invested in AIG. But I just asked you what your enterprise value was worth in the last round. Right. And I asked you so you'd have an opportunity to take the $35 billion here, the $40 billion here, and say these enterprises, after we get, we get into a good situation, are worth X amount, mm -hmm. offsetting, you know, 100 percent of the debt potentially and returning, because a year ago, a year and a half ago, you could have been worth $100 billion for your stock price. I agree that our investment of 40 to 70 billion at the height of your stock in the last two years would have been whole. My question to you, though, was, and I'd like you to answer for the record, is break down what you believe the enterprise value is today. Mr. Kashkari, when he was before this committee, told us he didn't know what he paid for things and he didn't know what they were worth and he couldn't answer it, but he'd give us a report in 30 days. He resigned in roughly 29 days, apparently, so he's not back. Mm -hmm. Please do not think you're not going to be back before us if you can't answer what you believe today, 
the enterprise value is so that given the, a static economy, not pie in the sky and not future earnings, but the real value of your enterprise, what it's worth. What have the American people bought for $190 billion? Mm -hmm. the, the assets minus the liabilities, including all the money that we owe, either to the Federal Reserve or, or to TARP, that number is what's left over and that's what's represented in that 2.7 billion shares at a buck 85 or so a share. But that's after you settle all of the obligations. So your answer today is we're completely solvent other than our $40 billion has become 70% of $4 billion. That's where we are. That's the answer you're giving me here today when you answer that way, is that assets and liabilities balance in the enterprise value. What's left is the hypothetical market that the market is saying, which is $4 billion. And that's $40 billion of our money and the rest of the stockholders. So that says we have a loss, in your, in your statement, of that delta, call it $38 billion. If that's what you believe, fine, no, but no. that's what the market is marking your stock for. What right. I asked you for was your real belief of your enterprises, individual enterprises' value. You know, you can normalize them for uh, multiples of EBIT, their, what their PEs would be in an ordinary market, what their PEs would be on a, uh, uh, on a separate company basis. You know all the ways to value it. I just think this committee should have an understanding of today what you believe the enterprise which you're running and the trustees are overseeing is worth in a way that we can have some understanding of why you think you'll pay us back over and above what you gave us here today. And, and I appreciate the fact that the stock is whatever it is on a given day. What I want to know, and I think the chairman and I both want to know, is just how you value the break, these assets normalized. We understand you may not realize them for two years, but we have been asking for those kinds of numbers since previous president and previous everybody in this cycle. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I'll just take one more crack at it. Those assets, if you take the assets that I just talked about earlier and added them all up, they'll add up to whatever, 80 or 90 billion dollars. I can't do the math that fast. And that should be enough to satisfy the 83 billion dollars that we actually owe to either the Federal Reserve or the, or, or the uh, United States Treasury now. To the extent we have to use more of the 30 billion dollars, we hope that we'll be able to get recover that value by having even higher asset values because we plug an asset hole or what have you. So the asset values should be sufficient to satisfy what all of the obligations of the company are and, and keep the taxpayer whole if the marketplace stays strong. That leaves only the, the stub residual value, which right now is that five or six billion dollars. And hopefully this all works out well and that's worth more and more. Thank you very much, Mr. Liddy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, for your testimony, and then you can see, based on the questions here, that we are frustrated. And people, uh, you know, woman, yes, just a moment. Uh, I was getting ready to let you go, but I, we have uh, Councilman Maloney. Yes. First of all, I want to thank you for your for your public uh, service uh, and for coming in uh, to help out. Um, why did AIG meet the criteria of systemic risk, while Lehman Brothers did not? Uh, Congressman, you have, you'd have to ask the Treasury Secretary and, and the Federal Reserve, uh, uh, New York Federal Reserve individual that made that decision at the time. Um, they, they made determinations that municipalities and foreign uh, governments were systemic importance to the United States banking system. Do you share that belief? And the I, think the payout? I think the totality of AIG represented systemic risk, not just the counterparties, but the, the guaranteed Technology. investment contracts and all of the policyholders that we have, I, I think had that uh, failed, I think it would have, been, would have created a real problem. What, what proportion of the AIG uh, counterparties would have faced bankruptcy without federal bailout of AIG? I, I, just, I do not know. And uh, uh, could you, have you seen or could you pro provide the committee with any analysis of the impact of the ownership of the residential mortgage-backed securities by AIG's life insurance companies, including whether problems in AIG's life insurance business as a re result of their purchase of, of these played a role in the decision to provide the bailout. Basically, I have heard that the um, life insurance portion of AIG was regulated and was solvent. Is, is that true or not? That the life insurance portion did not receive nor did it need bailout, that it was properly managed? It was regulated and it was solvent, but 
as values of the residential mortgage-backed securities went down, uh, because that was part of the investment that they had, it created a hole, and that hole has been, we've plugged some of that hole with money from the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve money has gone into yes. that. Yes. And, uh, uh, and uh, AIG argued that the bailout was necessary because of potential problems in the life insurance business, and you believe that is true. I do. H how much went into the life insurance vision? Divi division. Uh, uh, it was uh, somewhere between 17 and 20 billion dollars really? to, to make up for the loss in asset values. Really? And uh, uh, going forward, do you think, I, I read in the paper that AIG does not need another infusion of, uh, of, of, of public money. Uh, do you foresee that in the future you will not need any public money, additional public money? Congresswoman, I certainly hope so. As I've said many times, uh, we think what we have, we have a good plan that will enable us to repay the American taxpayer. But it's very dependent upon what happens with the economy and what happens with global financial markets. If they were to go south the way they did in the fourth quarter, that could change. If they remain stable or improve the way they appear to be, they, they appear to be doing, that would be good news for our efforts. Well, let's hope they remain moving in the right direction. Again, I want to thank you for coming in as a public service to help uh, restructure one of America's great businesses. And finally, some employees of uh, AIG are questioning uh, the breakup of the company. They're saying that this is really not good for the future of a competitive business in America. And could you, could you comment on the breakup and the selling off of assets of AIG? I think in, in many of those companies that are going to recep receive separate identities and will be spun off company, those people are excited about that prospect. So in an AIA or an Alico, uh, there's great excitement about those businesses. With respect to our property casualty business where we'll sell at least a minority interest in it and we'll separate from the AIG name, there's great excitement there. If, if you work maybe in a technology area or an operations area in the corporate core, you might have a different thought about it because your job, your job could be eliminated or you could get picked up by one of those companies as they get spun off. And finally, uh, the insurance division was regulated, but also the risky products uh, division was regulated under the Office of Thrift Supervision, the regulator that AIG selected because they had a small portion of their company that was an SNL. And uh, could you comment on the quality of regulation coming out of the Office of Thrift Supervision on the, uh, the, the uh, so-called risky products, uh, AIG financial products? Uh, Congresswoman, I, I can't, although the last time I was before Congress, there was an individual from the OTS who, if I remember his testimony, said, you know, they just didn't have the wherewithal to be able to regulate something as massive and complicated as, uh, as AIG financial products. Again, uh, thank you for your public service, and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Congresswoman. And also thank you, Mr. Liddy, for your time. And of course, um, um, we uh, appreciate you coming. And uh, thank you so much for the information that you've given us. But we, as you can see on this side, there's a tremendous amount of frustration and that we're trying to ask, answer questions that are being raised. And at the same time, we're also trying to protect Americans, uh, people's tax dollars, which is also very important. So we thank you very, very much and for coming today. Thank you. Now we move to the second. I'd like to welcome the second panel, but let me say it's a long-standing tradition here that we swear all of our witnesses in. So if you would please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Thank you. you may be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. Let me um, suggest an order. 
Why don't we go in this order? Um, uh, Mr. 